Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against Lodric. In today's video, we're going to be playing the April 23rd replay, and we will be playing the April 24th turn. I believe we have one more day, maybe two more days of the ceasefire before things kick off with what I assume will be a massive Japanese raid into the Indian Ocean. At least that's what it seems to be shaping up to be. So we'll see how that goes over. Um, but for the moment, we're still in the last couple of days, the, the calm before the plunge, if you will. And we'll, we'll see how these next few days uh, unfold. So far, really quiet, no submarine activity in the, uh, in the PM phase, moving into the, or sorry, the, the night phase, the AM night phase. And we're moving into the air phase here. Uh, looks like we did get some submarine activity here off the coast of New Zealand. A Japanese submarine decided to waste torpedoes on a patrol craft of ours out here to the northeast of the North Island. I don't even know what the I-21 is doing, but if it wants to waste its torpedoes on our patrol craft out there, um, then great, uh, go ahead and, and do that. Um, the Gato is bottoming out. It looks like a Japanese destroyer is trying to depth charge it just south of Singapore. Um, some near misses. Submarine skippers evading patterns. I, this is shallow water, so this is risky for us. Um, you know, Japanese ASW is not very good early in the war, but it certainly isn't something where you want to be caught in too shallow a situation because uh, that's where submarines die. But um, looks like it just it was an individual Japanese submarine attacking near Linga, uh, and the Gato was depth charged, but no damage to it as far as I can tell. I don't know if the PG has depth charges like a Gmail. I'll have to take a look. I don't remember offhand. Can't remember if it's part of an ASW task force I put together or not either. Or if it was escorting some shipping, I'm not sure. We'll have to take a look. There's a lot to keep track of and sort of manage in this in this game. Lusitin, Lusitini, uh, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. And Sean Mack, I'm doing great. Uh, somewhat of an eventful week, right? But uh, at least in, in my personal life, things are going okay. Okay, moving into the PM phase. Catalina spotting various shipping or enemy subs or whatever. Subs off the east coast of Australia? Need a break from the other war for a while? Yeah, oh, the real life one? I guess. Um. Never in the history of human conflict has so much information been shared on social media of which maybe 30 percent of it tends to be true and the other 70 percent is like recycled footage from like eight years ago or five years ago or just blatant terrible takes by people or just incorrect information that's not backed up by sources but you know all right so we've got a bunch of japanese bombing attacks here over java yeah, I'm probably being generous. The reliability rate of information that you see on Twitter about wars as they're going on is less than the reliability rate of the Mark 14 torpedo. Not to trivialize anything. All right, so let's see here. Japanese infantry regiment attacking to the east of Padang. Assuming these troops will be driven back, if not completely destroyed. They took that base. Our troops are surrendering, all of them? Aw, I guess since the Japanese had troops at Padang, they didn't retreat. So they lost about 169 troops, 9 infantry squads, 12 non-combatants. Japan lost nothing. Deliberate attack at Padang against a base force. And they took the base, the unit surrenders, another 248 uh, destroyed, no combatants, but uh, it's just a base force with no infantry. Allied shock attack at Chengtha, as you remember, I think we were advancing, yeah, we were advancing east. Um, 
I'm kind of surprised. I didn't realize there were that many. So it looks like there was the 45th Chinese Corps versus the 27th, 13th Division. So two Japanese divisions, an independent mixed brigade, and then an army headquarters unit. This is just northwest of Changsha. So we did run into some Japanese troops there. Coast Coast expands the island fortifications up to level three, which is nice. I was kind of keeping keeping track on that, and I was worried, or I was I'm not worried, but I was wondering when uh, when that would get up to three, and it looks like it's this turn. So that's an atoll with a decent uh, pair of uh, Australian infantry battalions. It won't hold up against like a really strong Japanese attack with strong bombardments, but with three levels of fortifications now and over seventy assault value, should hold up against like a single SNLF unit. Unless Japan sends, like, a huge bombardment task force to nuke the island. But that would certainly be, I think, a waste of Japanese resources. Um, Steady Claudio, thanks for the follow. And Sean Mack, thank you for the resub, by the way. I might have already said that, but I do appreciate the support. 17 months is a long time to support the channel, and I do appreciate it. P. Warner, you think it would take a division to take the island? I don't know. I would guess, oh, whoops. Uh, I would guess it would take uh, maybe a brigade or a regiment with a strong bombardment task force. But the Japanese are past their sort of advantage phase where like up till April, they, they get to unload troops incredibly quickly. So now troops are unloaded much more slowly, which makes taking islands quickly difficult. But yeah, we've got two pioneer battalions here, total of 76 assault value they're good units, too. The experience isn't great at 40, but they've got good morale. They've got good equipment. They've got good sections, infantry sections of 1942. They've got level 3 fortifications. Not a ton of supply. Again, only 4,500. So a strong bombardment task force would really eat into that. They've got a decent amount of defensive mines to keep the Japanese landings honest. 107 defensive mines. And really, the holding Coast Coast is just to make sure that he doesn't get float planes out here that just completely shut down any ability to transfer supplies north-south between Australia and Sri Lanka and the uh, Indian Ocean. Are we playing one or two, one, two or three day turns? We're playing one day turns, Terje. Okay. So we've got some escort units moving away. Basically just some support stuff. And some shipping. I think all of our cargo was unloaded at Rangoon. So Rangoon is unloaded. The supply there is dropped on to 64,000. Not sure where it all went. I'm guessing some of it is being eaten up by the troops at the front, but not that much. Only 4,600 south of Pegu. Pegu itself only has 14,000. Mandalay only has 13,000. Those numbers don't seem really any higher than they had been before. I suppose it could be sucked into, into China. We also have started to bring some Chinese troops into the Burmese theater. Um, we've got the 88th Chinese division here. They're loading up on trains and they're going to move to Pegu where they're going to start drawing considerable reinforcements once they can kind of flood themselves under supply. Maybe I'll change Pegu to Rangoon. Pegu's supply numbers, I think, are not quite high enough. If I get them up like over 50,000, I think that rapidly increases how quickly the uh, the troops draw on reinforcements. I know maybe it's not 50,000, but I know there's there's like when you have an overabundance of supply, it can really make things happen more quickly. Uh, meanwhile, the situation in China. So we did have the 45th Corps, which was pulling southwest, uh, ran into the Japanese troops at Changtha, where we ran into two divisions, a brigade, and then what was it, a headquarter unit here. So we know they're pretty strongly dug in there. We have moved some of our troops across the river, which had been defending this river line here uh, toward Ch Chongqing, just to kind of have more of a forward defense and good defensive terrain. Um, I didn't. I haven't moved the troops south of of Chikikang forward too much. Just the one hex across the river. Uh, Chikikang, meanwhile, also is up to level five fortifications. They're a quarter of the way to level six, so this could really turn into like a nightmare fortification type deal. For us that will really allow us to free up a lot of troops and move them elsewhere and defend like you know just rough terrain um you know if we can get up to like level six i, th I think chung king is only level six right now we don't have the engineers i don't think to move it to seven or maybe we do it was red before so i'd have to take a look into that um 
But yeah, so th- that's a great situation there. We've also moved some troops down the rail line to the east of Quilin, try and kind of create a bit of a trip wire if the Japanese try and bring their armor down this main roadway. I haven't really detected where the large numbers of Japanese armored units are. It does look like there's 18 units here, which had been pulling back from Cyan. I can't tell if these guys are still withdrawing east or not. But in theory, their supply line is cut here by the troops that cross the river. These troops are like shot to pieces. There's like nothing left. Remember, we lost several annihilation battles southeast of Yan'an. But it looks like there's still 18 units here, which in theory could move down this rail line back towards Cyan and, and make our life painful there. Really should build that fortification up. Get it, get it stronger if we can. Um, but if there were really 18 units here, I guess his armored spearhead could still be here. Um, I don't think he's going to drive west with his supply line interdicted. It does look like some troops to the east at Tuyan are are moving west. So there's 41 units here. I suppose this could also be his armored spearhead. Well, I guess we'll find out when he goes after the 83rd and 33rd Chinese corps. I don't see any indication of these guys trying to flank me moving toward Yan'an. But one other option is he could try and just flank Cyan altogether and move up this roadway here through this this terrain and then just get in behind Cyan. That's definitely a strategy. We are digging in quite a few troops here sort of in the mountains uh, to block a northern flanking movement on Chongqing. But he could probably go up to the north here and take northern China. Expect the armor to show up where you don't want it. Yeah. I mean, my expectation is that he was going to swing the armor south and, and make a main road advance. Because we're much less well dug in down here. And we've shifted a lot of like anti-tank and other units up to the north. So it'll take us a long time to get them south. So that felt like our soft underbelly where we didn't want the tanks. But... Based on these unit tallies up here, I mean, he certainly could have broken up a lot of his divisions into fragments, but 41 here, 18 here, 10 here, like it feels like he's still heavily concentrated in the north, and maybe he just hasn't had a chance to move these troops out yet. They are on rail lines now, so he could move them more rapidly. Uh, but still, it, it, it's at the moment, it looks like a big concentration of his troops are up north. So we'll have to kind of consider that as we think how best to, to move forward and approach things going forward. You think 20,000 will do it? 20,000 what? Supply? Um, Chongqing's supply level is 52,000. So China's supply situation is much better than uh, it started the war with, which is usually not what you're saying in April of 42, but with Rangoon still open, the Burma Road still open, and with excess supply in the Burma Theater, we're both getting sort of our bonus of supply because the Burma Road's open, which I think is, what, 2,000 a day, or is it 200? I, I can't remember. But then we're also siphoning some additional supply over land, you know, um, because we're so heavily supplied in the Burma Theater. So that's nice. Um, no indication, I don't think, that the shipping has left, oh my god, 254 ships in harbor at Singapore? Holy hell. Whoa. Three fleet carriers and an escort carrier apparently spotted to the south of Singapore? Are they still moving to Singapore? Is this Could this be more elements of the Kitty Butai that maybe hadn't arrived yet? It doesn't give me any direction on these guys. Just says they're spotted to the south of Singapore. So either they left Singapore or he's still massing at Singapore. Hmm. I don't have any way to bomb Singapore anyway with a major bombing raid. I don't even think our bombers of Batavia can make it there. Maybe some float planes, but that's about it. Why would he need a fleet that big, Whippets? I mean, it's a good question. I've heard that he's kind of a death stack type of a player where he's just mounts his entire fleet in one area where you can't possibly challenge it. I suppose that could be a strategy. We do have about 30,000 supply on the way to Colombo. Um, oh, did they not unload at Rangoon? Oh, 
Oh wait, no, never mind. They're coming from Calcutta. I, I got confused with shipping. Yeah, so we're pulling, we're bringing that supply to to Colombo, which is probably a good idea. We only have about thirty three thousand supply there. Meanwhile, we probably should get our carriers and such going this turn. Nobody's repairing, right? Just the fin back. But I don't, I don't really want my carriers to get caught in port. So if we only have one day left on the ceasefire and we've spotted even more Japanese carriers down here, not sure where exactly they're headed to, but that's something we've got to not get caught in port and, and obliterated. Um, if we go to um, Cape Town, we can see here we are closing in on getting some awesome ships back. The battle cruiser Repulse is just two days away from returning to action. She's being repaired pier side, so she's all ready to sort of transfer back into active duty. She only has two days left on repair, and she could easily put to sea now without any real major problems. She's got four system damage, which frankly is more, which is, is less system damage than most ships and active task forces have. So she's really just getting a fresh coat of paint. Other than that, the ship is ready for action. She will be back in action in two days. Probably should pull the Concord out of the shipyard too. Five system damage, 14 days. There's no reason for you to be taking up shipyard space. So go ahead and move you to port side. Um, I believe this was an upgrade. That's why when we change the priority, it doesn't change the, the amount of days left on the estimate here. But you can see that it's got 14 days left on the repair estimate. Um, just got a, an upgrade here. So she's got radars now of the Omaha class, but she's got uh, air search and surface search radars. Uh, and uh, and so those upgrades have occurred. Also upgraded with some 20 millimeter Orlicons, which will be nice um, uh, for some anti-aircraft coverage. So we can go ahead and move her to pier side and 14 days left at pier side, taking her out of the shipyard, helping the ships in the shipyard uh, move a little bit more quickly. The cruiser Sumatra has 41 days left until her repairs are complete. Does she have a withdrawal date? I don't see one. I don't know why I thought she had a withdrawal date, but I guess not. Anyway, she's uh, currently in the shipyard with low priority. 17 flood damage still left on her. Most importantly, the Mark 15 torpedo. <laughs> Um, we also have some destroyer escorts, the John D. Ford and the John D. Edwards chilling at pier side. Um, and then a bunch of AKEs, which I believe are conversions, which are just finishing up in about nine more days. So, um, meanwhile, the port itself is pretty empty. We've got shipping on the way to the map. 13,000 troops here. These guys will be on map in eight days. We're going to have to be really careful with these. Like, we've got some really big task forces with huge air wings. They're going to be on map in a little over a week. And if the Japanese launch, like, a 200-ship raid into the Bay of Bengal or into the Indian Ocean, we got to make sure those guys don't get absolutely obliterated. The Prince of Wales on critical repair. I'd have to take a look. I know when we looked at moving her to critical at one point, it wasn't going to make a difference in dates, so she's set to high. If we move her to critical, it saves us one day, so I'm not going to do that right now. Um, she is still six six knot cruise speed, which limits us to one hex. Really, the if you know, it'd be interesting if you could prioritize what you would repair. Because if I could choose what I would repair, I would 100% focus on engine damage. Because if we can get this up to two or three hex speed per phase, then it will make more sense rather than having the Prince of Wales sit here for almost, you know, two thirds of a year, it would make more sense to send her to Great Britain and finish the repairs there because they'll occur much more quickly or the U.S. East Coast because the repairs at that off map base are much more efficient than Cape Town. I think they're like twice as efficient. But the problem is if we if we do that now with her current speed, the amount of time it'll take to transit will really negate any advantages we have in terms of repair efficiency. But if we can cut that sailing time in half or more by getting a faster ship, then then it really becomes one of those scenarios where it makes a lot of sense. Right now, it doesn't. Uh, meanwhile, we are also reinforcing Diego Garcia. So one other thing, like if he is trying to launch a raid into the Indian Ocean, he could be making landing, planning to make landings on Sri Lanka. We've already done a lot to reinforce Sri Lanka. So we've got two British crack British brigades, 80 experience, 95 morale. 
infantry brigade. So like two thirds of a crack division right there. We also have an Indian brigade here. We've got an American tank battalion unit here, which isn't great on experience, but as you know, better tanks than anything the Japanese have. Uh, we've got an American infantry battalion, or at least elements of the 102nd uh, infantry battalion, an American combat engineer b battalion. We've really reinforced Sri Lanka pretty heavily uh, at Colombo, but then even outside of Colombo, we've got another Indian brigade at Trikamali, and then we've got a brigade at Kogola. So we basically have a full Indian division on Sri Lanka, two thirds of a British division, and then what amounts to uh, essentially a brigade plus of American armor and support troops. So really, it's like two good divisions with good support and artillery and things like that. Um, that recon regiment in the Eastern Army, yeah, doesn't have great equipment with it. But the other guys are, are all good. So if he did land at Sri Lanka, then, you know, I think we're in good shape. I think the risk, uh, that's a good call out whippets. The risk is like, what if he lands at uh, Kozo Bazaar or Akiab or more realistically, Ramir Island? You know, those are those are definitely places that would be uh, a problem for us. We are trying to move troops to Ramir to slow him down. We've got a British infantry brigade uh, or Indian infantry brigade moving down from India to uh, to Ramir Island to try and slow him down. It's a really shitty brigade. 20 experience, 29 morale. But it's all I've got, and I've been trying to move some troops in that way. That would be the most likely place for him to land behind our front. So if he landed here, then, you know, he could try and push in east and cut us off. Um, the problem is there's no road link from Ramir anywhere. Ramir has a zero port capacity limit. It has a zero air capacity limit. He could build it up over time. He could try and move the units across a non-connecting hex. I don't think it would be very smart for him. Like, it would take a long time to move from Ramir to these adjacent hexes. Um, so not too worried about that. Uh, if he would land at, uh, where were you saying? Zagipan? Where even is that? I don't see any other landing place. It was a bizarre Akiab Chittagong. I don't see another base where he could. Re I mean, oh, you mean like on the Indian? I think we get emergency reinforcements if he lands on the Indian subcontinent. And I don't think Japan at this time has forces to launch an invasion of India proper. I think that would be absolutely insane if he was to land here. Um, could he do it? Sure. Um, would he be advised to do it? I mean, he probably doesn't know how many troops we have in Burma exactly. Um, he probably doesn't know we've stripped a lot of troops out of India. But if he did land there, he would need to bring a lot of troops to have any realistic chance of pushing inland. And it would take a long time to get them unloaded, to get them supplies, to do all of that stuff. And then, honestly, we've got 200 fighters down at Rangoon. We've got like 100 bombers at Lido. We've got another 300 fighters on transports that will arrive in India in a little over a week. Like, he, we, we would, in the span of 10 to 14 days, we would have 600 modern aircraft against... Well, he can't, I mean, he couldn't keep the Kitty Butai deployed to the Bay of Bengal indefinitely. He would attrit his best air units too quickly. So I'm not too worried about him trying to flank all of this and move in there. I mean, he wouldn't even have the equipment to stop us transferring troops from Sri Lanka back to India. I, I just think that would be unwise. Um, he could go for Trikamali. He could certainly land at Trikamali. The repair yards aren't there, though. The repair yards are at Colombo. So he'd have to take Colombo to take take out the repair yards. So that's that's not. I don't think that's likely. You can see the shipyards are at uh, at Colombo, and honestly, because it's so far forward, I don't put a lot of repair stuff in Colombo. Like it's convenient to be able to throw subs in there or destroyers, or if you've got like a week and you want to do a minor upgrade on a major ship, like you can do that. But it's just not super likely. Um, to uh to i think go for 
Um, well, he could go for that. Sri Lanka is definitely a target, but we, we have troops at Colombo to defend it. Don't tell me what to do. Strat mode can be can be valuable for the American troops here. Because here's the thing, is if he if he, I don't I don't think he would land at Colombo, that would be a bloodbath. So if the Japanese did land troops on Sri Lanka, they could land them at Jaffna, they could land them at Trikamali, they could land them at Kagala. To have troops in strat mode is actually beneficial, uh, or can be, because you can rapidly redeploy them uh, over these rail lines here on the island. So, But, anyway. So we'll see. Um... So that's kind of the major development. As we see, they've got over 250 ships at Singapore. They've got carriers to the south of Singapore. Um, you know, not not sure what all might be moving. 130 ships in Surabaya? That's nuts. Must be a lot of cargo ships. Maybe we should launch an air raid there. Does he have... He, does, he only has 11 fighters at Surabaya? What's our air force look at? Like at Batavia... Could probably get like six Mitchells and seven DB sevens, so thirteen medium bombers with another six Catalinas, maybe. We could get like a twenty ship air aircraft attack coming in at a low level. Might do some damage to a few ships there. Have to consider that. Uh, what's the uh, fort construction of Batavia? Eighteen percent. Uh, meanwhile, slowly starving in the Philippines. If he's masked at Singapore, where is he weak, Union? Um, presumably in the Central and, and South Pacific, I would guess, is where he's weakest. Um, you know, he's probably got a strong, at least in terms of naval forces. We don't know what he has in terms of ground forces. I would expect him to have reinforced New Caledonia, maybe gone for like Espiritu Santos or other places like that. I am planning a small amphibious landing at Savi, uh, as well as perhaps at Canton Island to take these bases back, mainly just to shore up our or shore up our slocks or our, our strategic line of communications here by taking Savi and Canton. We will push any potential float plane bases back considerably making our supply situation or our shipping situation much more secure, uh, at least until you get around New Caledonia where you can still put a pretty big thorn in our side as we try and move to Australia. But at least those bases here, these forward bases here, likely counterattacks, I think, for us. Hornet raid, maybe. I mean, we do have the Hornet. She is at Pearl Harbor. She's kind of doing nothing. Um, but I also, a single carrier raid in 42, yeah, I mean, we know the Japanese are probably all massed at Singapore, and there's no real threat to uh, to the Hornet out here. The problem, the Hornet only has a single fighter squadron. So if we sail out and go for a raid of Kwajalein or something like that, if he's got a single squadron of Zeros or even Claude's at, at Kwajalein and they escort Bettys or Nels, those fighters are probably going to tangle with ours, probably tie them up enough, and then you're going to have 20 Nels or Bettys get through to attack. And even if our flak is pretty damn good, you're looking at at least a damaged carrier, maybe a sunk carrier. So I just don't think a single carrier raiding task force against anything like that is super smart. Um, we could maybe go for a raid on Midway. That might be the kind of thing where it's close enough to friendly bases. You could probably scout it out with float planes or other things like that. We do have some caddies at uh, Lace on the island just to the southeast of it. So maybe we could go for like a raid at Midway. I doubt he's got any shipping there. Um, but other than that, you know, other than maybe supporting the attacks on Canton Island or Savi, I just don't see the Hornet having a ton of potential as a raider maybe you sail it out somewhere where he can see it so he's got some intel that the americans have a carrier in the in the central or eastern pacific maybe that throws him off to not realizing that most of our carriers are over here in the bay of bengal that's definitely something that you could do um you know one strategy and i know it's a little gamey that people sometimes do is they'll put fleet oilers in a task force and a lot of times 
uh, planes when they're doing their recon will identify a fleet oiler as, as a flat top. They'll identify an AO as a CV or a CVL. And so that can throw you off and be like, oh, my God, the enemy, do they have carriers coming this way or something like that? Um, so you could do that. That's again, that's a little gamey, but, um, but you could use the Hornet as sort of a, as a, as a, as not bait, but as misdirection, if you will, if you fly it somewhere that, you know, you're in float plane range, but you're outside the range of a Betty or an L carrying a torpedo, then you can, I think you could potentially use it. And, and maybe that's worth considering of where we would want to send it so that he would see that. I think the problem is if he knows you only have one carrier, like he's, if he sees like for sure, if he has really high confidence, this task force has one carrier, then you run into some problems where it's like, well, now he's going to be thinking where are the other carriers, right? Like, why did he let me see this here? Um, and so you got to be really careful because um, one, it's a lot to risk on, not a lot to, to gain. Uh, and two, in terms of the misdirection, it could actually give away more than you would like. All right. So if we take a look at the intelligence report for this turn, looks like we've got four operational losses for the Japanese today, two for the Allies um, in terms of aircraft, three Nels for the Japanese, which makes me think maybe he was doing like a, a, trans, a transfer between bases. Um, you can definitely lose ops losses that way. Um, we lost two Catalinas. He lost an A7K2 Alf. Uh, ship sunk. I don't think anything or that's available. Ship sunk. I don't think anything sank today. What? It said we got the I-159 near Geraldton. Be great if true. If like our ASW aircraft sank it. We did lose a, a submarine of our own to Japanese ASW aircraft not that long ago. It'd be great if true. A lot of times these are bad fog of war stuff. Yeah, we could use the Hornet to cover an invasion of Midway or, or something like that. Um, in terms of ship sunk, I know someone last episode asked to see like what's all been sunk so far. So if we go ahead and take a look at the at the points ranking top to bottom. Uh, we did not sink the here you we put we put two torpedoes into it near Singapore but I'm pretty certain it didn't sink anyway we're claiming we we sank the here you pretty sure that's not true we also claim we sank the Haruna we know that is true that happened in early December uh, we also lost the Houston there we lost uh, a large transport the President Coolidge fleet uh, submarine tender Otis uh, several tankers in Commonwealth and Dutch uh, shipping groups the light cruiser Raleigh, uh, the AMC uh, Manora. Uh, it's probably easier if we do it like this. So let's look at the allied ship sunk. The biggest ship we've lost so far is a heavy cruiser. We've not lost any capital ships so far. No battleships, nothing like that. We have lost, in terms of warships, we've lost not that many. We've lost, uh, looks like five cruisers, uh, four lights, and a single heavy. Um, Nothing recent. Uh, the last one we lost was near Tulagi in, in uh, February, which I think was when we had... Wait, we lost the dragon? I don't remember her sinking. Was that when we, like, jaunted out and had that light cruiser battle? Huh. Also the Ceres near Belip Island. Lame. Anyway, um, and then we lost... We've lost a, f a couple of destroyers as well. Um, some of these near Marising during that, that battle. In terms of support ships, we've lost a lot of APs. I'm actually a little bit frustrated with how many troop transports we've lost. This has been the biggest pain in our side, and this is going to really prevent amphibious assaults before 43 being large because we've lost a lot of these guys, and, and you don't have a lot of troop transports to begin with. Um, and so that's not not great news uh, in terms of these. Now, a fair number of these are really small, dinky ones that probably wouldn't matter much. These two two victory point value Commonwealth and British ones, but like the President Coolidge, that's a big loss. The Rangatia, the Hugh Scott, the Wharton, the Duntron, the Republic. These are all considerable losses that that kind of suck. Uh, we've also, I think, lost a fair amount of tankers. Not too many, but you know, what was that like ten or so? 
of which f- five or six of them are like big legitimate losses. These two Dutch ones are very small tankers. I think they only had like an 1800 carrying capacity with a 10 knot max speed. When you compare that with like a fleet, you know, fleet tanker, 16 knot speed, uh, 12,000 uh, capacity. You can see the reason there's a big victory point discrepancy. AKs, we've lost a fair amount of them, but we get a ton of these, you know, victory ship type deals. So uh, these losses are, even though there's a lot of them, don't really matter that much. Uh, we've lost four subs so far, two U.S. Navy ones. The Sarjo is the only fleet boat. We lost one S boat. We lost two Dutch submarines as well. Only one of those in the last two months. Uh, auxiliaries, fleet tender, submarine tender, um, a uh, aircraft tender, the Langley, which was originally an aircraft carrier at one point. Um, not a lot of stuff there. We've actually lost a lot of mine sweepers and mine layers. Have we lost any? A few cruiser, quite a few cruiser mine layers, mostly Dutch. Some PUT boats and harbor stuff, and that's about it. Now, on the Japanese side, they've lost a lot less, but we'll still take a look at it. So let's take a look at their warships. The heavy stuff, we know they lost the Haruna. We don't think they lost the Hiryu. Pretty certain we have sunk two or three Japanese light cruisers, the Katori, Kashima, and the Tenru. I want to say one of those was at Tarawa when we did a carrier raid back in January. Um, and then we also had some cruiser actions uh, with the Katori and Kashima, where U.S. 8-inch gun cruisers near Mersing or Bilip Islands uh, may have sank, sank some Japanese light cruisers. So three Japanese light cruisers, a battleship confirmed sunk. Uh, the, the, heavy, the carrier's not. Um, in addition to that stuff, uh, destroyers, we've sunk a few, uh, four modern good ones. Uh, and then it looks like about another uh, eight uh, a varying degree of older or torpedo boats. So uh, 12 destroyers or torpedo boats all told. That, that actually seems like a pretty good number at this stage in the war, in my opinion. 12 destroyers sunk, 10 destroyers, two torpedo boats. I got to think that would eat into his uh, ASW capabilities quite a bit. Um, no, Josie. I don't know if anyone knew how if you're here. Or I guess I can. Band. Beat you to it. It's all good. Um, so that was the, the warships APDs. We did also sink three APDs. These are like fast destroyer troop transport tape deals. Um, we sank one at Palembang with a torpedo, uh, I think, uh, one near Mersing in that, uh, a battle of Mersing in the beginning of the game and one near Ambon. These are, these are definitely valuable ships. So it's a good thing. We sank several of them. Only two actual troop transports sunk the Ashima Maru and the Congo Maru. Uh, one of those at Midway, one near Ambon. Uh, in terms of AKs, not a lot. Like you can see, we don't even have to scroll here. Not a ton of shipping sunk there. Um, I don't even think we've sunk a tanker or an oiler yet. Doesn't look like. Now it is saying we've sank a fair amount of Japanese tor submarines. Ignore the bottom three because those are uh, sort of the small uh, midget submarines. But um, the other guy, the other fleet boats here, we've I, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Claiming ten Japanese submarines fleet boats I, that feels like a lot uh maybe it's not i don't know but 10 boats already uh i don't think japan is a huge sub force i don't think they get a ton of replacements so uh anything we can do to lessen their threat especially because they can just savage uh capital shipping with their big torpedoes in, in confined areas a couple of uh, float tank playing tenders an ake um that that uh, ammunition ship near truck uh, and then three AMCs of the big kind. So those are some nice losses inflicted on the auxiliary shipping. Uh, three cruiser mine layers, some patrol boats, and that's about it. So Japanese are definitely doing better in terms of ships sunk, but given we haven't lost any major ships yet, um, I think that's a pretty big win for us. Uh, all right, so you didn't realize the Prince of Wales got revenge on one of the torpedo boats which torped her? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, not, not the best trade. But, you know, it worked out to some extent, I guess. Um, in terms of what else are we looking at here? I mean, well, there's not a lot else to share for this particular turn. 
Uh, six days left till we get some engineers. Seven days till we get a bunch of other units here at like Sydney and Victoria. A lot of Australian reserves coming online. Although I think some of these are actually American units deployed to Australia. Um, like the EAB. Well, that's going to be Seattle. Never mind. But yeah, we've got the RAAF. So that's that's British or, or Commonwealth, I think. Um, yeah. So we've got a fair number of ground units coming online in the next week or so. Uh, Cape Town, nice. Oh, why is that of an assault value? Those convoys always throw me. We get 54 M3 Grant Lee tanks to the pool. Yes, we get 50 Matilda 2 tanks. Yes, so we can definitely use those to outfit one of those really poor tank units in Burma and give them much better equipment. That'll be nice. Um, 26th Indian Brigade arrives in seven days in Madras. 22nd East African Brigade arrives in seven days in, uh, or sorry, that was Madras. This one arrives in Mombasa, so we can move them to India as well. Um, the 75th IAC Regiment arrives in Madras, but it's restricted, so we can't move it. It's got crappy stuff anyway. A Canadian Brigade arriving in Victoria. They're restricted also. Sure, if there's anything worth scrapping out of them, Fifteenth New Zealand Brigade Brigade arrives in Auckland with some nice anti-aircraft equipment. Australian Heavy AA arrives in Sydney. Okay. What is what does the African unit look like in terms of its equipment? Um. I don't even know. I don't know what the, like it has 108 infantry squads, which apparently pull from an African rifle squad pool. So I don't, I don't know how those are rated in the game. Um, I'm guessing the pools are very limited because I don't think there's a lot of these units. Some nice 40 millimeter bow for any aircraft guns. The 25 pound artillery will be nice. And they're also in an unrestricted headquarters, so we can move them to India pretty quickly. So actually in the next week, we're going to get two brigades of reinforcements to India. Three brigades. We'll get the 26 Indian... The IAC arrives in Madras, although it's a regiment, I guess. And then the 22nd East Africa. So we'll have two brigades and some armor units arriving uh, that we can get to India as well. So I really don't think an invasion of India is uh, is terribly likely. Um, anything else worth looking at right now? Group reinforcement schedule for aircraft. I-15s in Chungking in two days. B-17s in Aden in three days. We get the Illustrious in four days. I forgot about that. So we get another British fleet carrier in four days. That'll be nice. The uh, Martlet is uh, F-4F Wildcats, basically, in the Royal Navy. Some Dauntlesses and Buffaloes arrive in Pearl in a week. Catalinas and Almeida. Lysanders arrive in Jazz. Shedpur. More hurricanes arriving in Aden. That'll be nice. Another hurricane squadron to help help deal with some of the American squadrons we have to pull out of Burma soon. Okay. Did we, by the way, did we get those C-47s? Did those arrive this turn? Or was that another turn? I don't even remember. I know we had some C-47s arriving. I don't remember when. I don't believe they've arrived yet. Oh, they're in uh, Chittagong. So we've got... 
1929 C-47s in Chittagong here. They've just arrived, so they're currently not ready. They've got to be repaired. But I, I believe we moved them by rail, so they're all four days or less repair time. Which is a weird mechanic in the game. Like, did, I don't if you didn't know, if you transfer units via rail, I believe the longest repair time, they always have to unpack, but they're always set to no more than four days, I believe. So, like, if you have a squadron that's badly shot up and they've got 10, 12, 14 days to repair a unit, I think you can actually transfer them by, via rail and that'll cut the transfer, the repair time down. Um, again, another gamey thing you can do. Haven't done that myself, but I know it's something I've, I've been told anyway, it's something you could do. All right. Um, what else we got, guys? What else do you want to look at? Is there anything else? Uh, it's a it's a quiet turn. It's the it's the calm before the plunge, if you will. So we looked at Batavia's entrenchments. Rangoon currently is at level three forts, working toward level four. I'm a little weary of continuing to build up the airfield at Rangoon. I think we'll stop at seven. That is the max before you get overstacking penalties, but also, or overbuilding penalties, but also I don't want to build too good of an airfield for the Japanese because I'm, I'm still assuming they will eventually retake Rang or take Rangoon. Or we should build forts at uh, Mandalay too. We're only at level three. We should really be building up all the forts around here. Anything to delay the Japanese advance eventually. We're almost to level four forts at Pegu. That'll be nice to help shield us from bombardment a little bit. Uh, but yeah, anything else you guys you guys want to see today? Some pretty big, I think, information that we saw in China. Let's take a look at the SIGINT. Planning for so the Mongol garrison army is still planning for an attack on Cyan. So maybe he's not going to shift his troops southwest to uh, to deal with the other fronts. Maybe he's going to keep his focus on Cyan. That would jive with the troops that are still deployed up there. What about Auckland? Did I, did I see something on here? I didn't. Am I, am I missing something? I don't see anything about Auckland in here. Uh, Terja, either... One or one of two things. We can use the C forty sevens to ferry more supplies into China. It's definitely a valid strategy. Um, one of the other things we could also do is use them to ferry supplies from India over into Burma because there's not good supply between these two. And if the Japanese are going to launch a major raid into the Bay of Bengal or in the Indian Ocean, we're going to steadily use the supplies up in Burma. Now, thirty transports flying from India to Burma are not going to be enough to support all the troops we have there. But it may slow down their consumption of their own supplies uh, to help uh, keep the large surplus we have in Burma uh, large uh, until we can resume our, our naval transport via, via sea. So that's kind of my thought initially, but eventually they'll probably be flying over the hump. The other thing is you don't we don't have really much in the way of replacements for those aircraft. And flying over the hump into China results in some pretty steady attrition of aircraft uh, through operational losses. So that's something else you got to be mindful of. We have about 500 assault value with some really good units in, in northern New Zealand. A couple of tank battalion, tank, uh, the 1st Army Tank Brigade with some Valentines. The 2nd USMC Tank Battalion with some Stuarts. Then we also have, I think these are regulars. I don't know, those are militias. Uh, a New Zealand Infantry Brigade, a Combat Engineer Regiment of the U.S. Army, some fortification units, 
some infantry battalions, which I believe we re-raised. So a lot of those are militia. They're not great. But we do have some artillery units there as well, which are pretty good. Oh, yeah. So we did have... It was just the individual patrol craft Jackson doing its ASW work. It does have depth charges. That's why we had it out there, because it, it is assigned to an ASW task force. So it did run into that Japanese submarine to the east of uh, east of New Zealand. Don't think it sank it, but it ran into it. Still unloading some troops at Raoul. We've got a RNZAF base force here. Remember, he tried to land. It was back when I think XTRG was in charge. They tried to land a, a landing force at Raoul, and, and it was unoccupied. Fortunately, we had some shipping that interdicted that. But now we've got an airfield here of level one, so we can use this base as a shuttle. It actually was a dot base before, but because we built a base here, now it's no longer a dot base. So now with this airfield here, we can shuttle aircraft from New Zealand up to the Fiji line and whatnot of even fighter squad, even fighter strike, like before bombers could fly because they have long enough range. But we couldn't get fighters up there because the, the distances were too big. Now we could hop them from New Zealand up into the Fiji line, or we could hop them back to keep them safe if an enemy attack came. New Zealand's too far from Australia, though, to hop fighters around, so there, there's still some limitations on what we can do there. But uh, at least, in theory, there's interlocking fields of support. Why does Japan have one island off Pago Pago here at Savi? Because they landed, uh, I want to say, a naval guard unit a while back, and they took the base, but they never, they never pushed further. So Savi will be one of our initial counterattacks. With that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap this video up here. I hope you guys enjoyed, and until next time, as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying thanks for watching, and until next time, I'm out.